So two weeks ago, we looked at the beginning of chapter 12 in John. Um, we saw, if you remember, the uh, anointing of Jesus by Mary, and then Jesus' triumphal entry. So two steps, in a sense, that were preparing Jesus to be uh, killed, buried, and raised again, right? We saw in his being welcomed in the triumphal em- entry, the one time in his whole ministry where he was publicly received as king, his rightful position, right? Um, so we're going to see, as things transition forward, this last part of chapter 12 is the very last part of Jesus' public ministry. So he closes out with this chapter, his public ministry. And everything forward from here, chapters 13 to 17, we're going to see is his ministry, his private ministry among his disciples. And some of the uh, most treasured scriptures that we think about in John are in, we think John 15, the section where Jesus is addressing his disciples. So that will be in the next and the few coming weeks. And then, of course, uh, Jesus' crucifixion. Um, So as we begin to think about the end of chapter 12, as Jesus is closing out his public ministry, I want you to think of a topic a little bit morbid, but imagine with me that in exactly one week, you are going to die, that I'm going to die. Imagine with me, what would we do this week in preparation for our home going? Going home to be with the Lord. What would we do in preparation? Who would we go, who would we call that's maybe far away? Who would we go visit in person? What amends might we make? What financial and logistical things would we try to wrap up in our life? Would there be a lot of things to do? How would we prepare? What would we say... Of course, we would, we would spend intimate time with the people that are closest to us, our friends, our family, those who mean the most to us. But if we had an opportunity perhaps to address all the people who are on the fringe of our social circles, maybe the barista at the bar that you frequent, maybe the, the clerk at the store that you go to every week, maybe the uh, servers in the restaurant, the pizzeria that you go to, people that are on the fringe of our social circles, if you could say something publicly to all of them, What would you say if you had a moment, a few minutes to speak to them in your last week of life? What would you say? In a sense, this last part of chapter 12, this passage, is going to be Jesus' last words to the people who are on his public circle, if you will. Um, He's going to speak from chapter 13 through 17 uh, to the most intimate people, his disciples, the closest to him. But... Today, he's finishing up what he wants to say publicly. It's going to be written in Scripture. He knows that. For the rest of eternity, it will be recorded as God's words. What is he going to say? We're going to see in these these verses the last things Jesus wanted to teach his public audience. The people that were perhaps not his close friends, but the people that he wanted to speak to uh, with these closing words. We'll also see how Jesus emphasizes the glory of God and faith in himself. He goes back over things that he's taught previously. These are his closing points. So as we begin to look at the text, we're not going to read all the verses because there's quite a few. Um, We're going to see he starts by talking about how death brings life. This is kind of a counterintuitive concept. Now some Greeks were among those who had gone up to worship at the feast. So those approached, so these approached Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Okay. So some, some Gentiles, perhaps they were ethnically Greek. We don't really know if they were ethnically Greek or just Gentiles. They came up and said, we want to see Jesus. A pretty worthy request, right? They wanted to have an audience with Jesus. Strangely enough, in the passage, Jesus never responds to them. He might have done that in in person, but it wasn't recorded here. We're going to see he turns and responds to his disciples. So these Greeks come and want to see him. And he uses this as an opportunity to say, now is the time for my death. So in a sense, with the Greeks coming to visit Jesus, it, it brings together the fusion of two worlds. Under Christ, when he dies, is buried, and rises again, under Christ, all peoples... The Jewish world, the Greek world, 
are all brought under one Savior, right? One Lord. So Jesus, in a sense, is, is fusing two very different disparate groups, right? So now the time has come. He says, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. If you remember in all the previous passages that we've seen when he talked about the time, the hour has not come. He said that multiple times. My time has not come. It's not time for me to die yet. In fact, Jesus evaded death many times. The Pharisees and the church leaders wanted to kill him before. He evaded that because he knew it wasn't time. Jesus had each step of his life clearly sovereignly programmed and, and planned. Now he's saying, it is the time. And in five or six days, he would go to the cross. He knew that. So now it is the time. And he's making that announcement. He's making it clear. He knows what's coming. So the time is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Right? So he goes on, and he's going to flesh out a concept for us in three stages. He starts kind of with a, a universal concept. He uses a, an agriculture metaphor, because it's an agrarian society, right? Almost everything they did was based around agriculture, how to feed people. That was their, their culture of the time. I tell you the solemn truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So as you know, to have a plant grow, you have to put a seed in the ground. That seed, in a sense, dies, becomes a plant, and makes many other seeds, right? Very simple agricultural concept. But Jesus is fleshing that out and saying, look, I will die and give my life. I will be buried. I will rise again. And millions upon millions will find life in me. So we got an agricultural concept that Jesus has made spiritual. And then he applies it in the next verse. It gets a little more personal. And he says, The one who loves his life destroys it. And the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. So the general concept is, if I live selfishly, I waste my life. I destroy my life. If I live selflessly, I will bless others, and I will be blessed. So that's the general concept. But let's go deeper. He talks about loving life and hating life. These are pretty absolute terms, right? Love and hate are really strong words, both in English and Italian and many other languages. We probably shouldn't take these quite so absolutely. He's not saying that I have to want to kill myself uh, to, to um, live for eternal life. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, what do I live for? Do I live for me? Do I live to satisfy me? Or do I live to satisfy the Lord? To serve others? And then going deeper, maybe an image that could help us a little bit. And all images break down at some point. But do I live with open hands? Is my life, is my time, are my resources available to the Lord? Offered to the Lord? So that when he wants to use them, they're his. Or do I live keeping my resources like this? My time, my things, my money. They're mine, God. If you've noticed, if you live like this, it's a lot easier for him to put things in your hands too, right? It's a lot easier to receive things if your hands are open. So this is just an analogy to think of. A life, the one who loves his life, lives like this. If you live selfishly, holding on to everything that's it's mine, you will live with a, a quality of life that is, is low. But if you live open-handed, the one who hates his life, it's not hating, despising your life, but living for someone else, that is the Lord, you live differently. So the paradox is, we find true life, the real way to live, the best way to live in Christ, is to die to self. It, it doesn't make sense, because our flesh says, no, you serve yourself, serve you. That's what our flesh tells us all the time, and we battle with that, right? So the battle is always, do I live for me to satisfy me, or will I live for the Lord? Will I serve Him? Will I live open-handedly or close-handedly? 
So it's counterintuitive. It goes against the grain of our flesh. Now one thing that's important to say when we read this is salvation is by faith alone in Christ. We don't receive salvation because we live for Christ or serve Christ. We receive salvation because we've trusted in Jesus alone. End of story. Right? It's not anything we do that gets us saved. It is our faith in Christ and everything that he did that saves us. So this is speaking to believers and speaking about eternal life. But eternal life is not only about length. Yes, when we trust Jesus, we are guaranteed an eternity in heaven with him. So the length of our life in heaven with him is eternal. But eternal life speaks also about quality. What he's saying here is we have an opportunity to live with a richness and fullness of life on earth and in heaven that's, that's different, that's supernatural. If I live with my life, my hands open, I will live with a richness and fullness of life in Christ on earth that's different than if I were to live like this, right? Life will be different. But he's also saying it'll be different in heaven as well. The best image that I've heard to describe um, the idea, the concept of rewards in heaven is one that Billy Graham used. And it's, it's a very simple image, and it's not perfect, but it can help us grasp uh, this concept. Billy Graham said, uh, everyone in heaven will have a vessel, a container of some sort. And that container will overflow. Everyone's container will be full of God's presence, of his glory, of joy, to overflowing, right? No one will be unsatisfied in heaven. Everyone will have the fullness of the presence of God, Jesus himself. So everyone will have a container that overflows. But the image is this. People who are faithful to God will have a bigger container, a greater capacity to enjoy the blessings of heaven. And people who are less faithful will have a smaller container. Now, just take, for example, maybe I have a cup like this and Francesco has a barrel. We're not going to be envious. There's no sin in heaven. We think of things now through a sin lens because we're fleshly. I'm going to be joyful that Francesco has a barrel to enjoy God and I will enjoy God with my cup. It won't matter. But what he's saying is that there will be a richness, a fullness in heaven for those who are faithful to the Lord as believers and in a greater measure. Okay? So there's incentive for us to serve the Lord, obviously because he's worthy of it, but also because he promises us rewards. Thinking on a, a morbid level, on an earthly level, think about those who are martyred for Christ. Those who live so selfishly that they give their lives for the cause of the gospel, for Christ. You would think on an earthly level, well, that would cause people to run away from Jesus. It's the blood of the martyrs that's the seed of the church. Have you noticed that in countries where people are persecuted and die for their faith, the church explodes. The gospel explodes. It does the opposite. When people's lives are lost for the name of Christ, it draws people to Jesus. Right? So this concept that Jesus is teaching is so true on every level. And then he goes one step deeper, one step further in verse 26. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be too. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So Jesus' servants should follow him, right? That's, that's pretty simple. He's saying, I'm the model Mimic me, follow me, walk with me. And then he says, if you do, as believers, I will make two promises with me. You get to go where I go. In other words, you will have my presence with you always. And then you will get to share in my glory. The Father will honor believers who are faithful. That's incredible to think that God the Father, Jesus is telling us this. I, I didn't make this up. God the Father will honor faithful believers. 
That's a tremendous promise. Now, obviously, anything we're able to accomplish for the Lord on earth is something that He's empowered, right? He's the one. The Spirit is the power behind anything we're able to do for the Lord. But Jesus is saying, if we faithfully serve Him and follow Him, that we will be honored, rewarded in heaven by the Father. That's an incredible promise. The next step is he goes on to talk about the urgency of why people should believe right now. Because obviously, Jesus is speaking to a broad public right now, most of which have not trusted him yet. Some of them have. But he's saying, it's urgent that you believe now. Trust in me now. And he fleshes out why. He says, now my soul is greatly distressed. And what should I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. No, but for this very reason I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. That's a summary of Jesus' life. Father, glorify your name. Jesus lived to honor and glorify his Father. And he, as a result, was exalted and lifted up as well, right? Right? Think about this. This is the last time we've heard God the Father speak audibly three times as recorded in Scripture. The first time was at Jesus' baptism. Remember, the dove comes down and the Father blesses his Son. Then the Father speaks again at Jesus' transfiguration. And then this last time, right before his death, we hear audibly the Father's affirmation, confirming, authenticating his Son yet again. And he goes on. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So, if you think about Jesus and Satan, as very much as opposites, um, Jesus illustrates perfectly the life like this. He was perfectly available to serve his father. And he perfectly followed and, and made himself available to follow his father's will. Right? Satan is the epitome of selfishness, of living selfishly, right? Opposite of where Jesus was. So Jesus is saying, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. The ruler of this world is Satan, right? Just another way of saying Satan. He's saying that on the cross and in my resurrection, death and Satan will be defeated. Definitively. Uh, Satan still operates in a limited sense in this world. God has allowed him a time, a period, uh, where he's allowed to operate. But he stands as a defeated enemy. He operates already defeated. Right? The end is already decided. The battle is already won. And that happened on the cross in the resurrection. And Jesus says, and when I am lifted up from the earth. So, he's going to be lifted up in two senses. Obviously... He's going to be lifted up physically. He's talking about his crucifixion. But in his crucifixion, Jesus will be exalted and glorified. Think of the glory that came to Jesus for being obedient to the point of death, being buried, and then rising again in glory. So he's raised up physically to the cross, and that allows him to be raised up and glorified into heaven. So raised up in two senses. And because of that, he will draw all people to himself. Literally, Jesus offers an invitation to every people, every culture, every color, every gender, anything you can think of on the human spectrum. Jesus is offering salvation to everyone. An invitation without any discrimination. Right? In, in our world of political correctness and, and discrimination on many different levels, Jesus offers salvation freely to all. He brings down all of the walls and says, if you will come to me by faith, all of you are offered salvation. Obviously, not everyone will come. Most will reject his offer. But the offer is made nonetheless to everyone. Now we see in verse 34 that the people are so confused. The crowd is always confused. We've seen all through John. Then the crowd responded, We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So they got hung up on the fact that how could the Messiah have to die? 
The Messiah is supposed to come and rule and reign and be victorious. Why would he die? So they were hung up on this. Jesus obviously was a different kind of Messiah. He was a suffering servant when he came the first time. He came to serve and give everything on the cross, which was unheard of. What, what king or ruler do you think of who gives everything away? He gives his best. Kings usually rule and conquer and have dominion over things. Jesus came this first time as a very strange king for the world to understand. He goes on in the next few verses and talks about why people should believe now. Speaking to many non-believers, Jesus replied, The light is with you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness may not overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he went away and hid himself from them. Jesus is saying, I'm here, I'm giving you the truth, believe now. Trust in me now. When I go away, it's going to be a lot harder to trust in me. Now we've got to remember that for those he's speaking to, most of them are not believers. And the opportunities are not infinite for someone to trust Christ. Right? You think of most people have to be presented the gospel many times before they finally trust in Jesus. What he's saying here is, you will not have infinite opportunity to trust in me. You may not have opportunity beyond right this minute. None of us know. We may get in our cars and today may be our last day. We are not promised tomorrow or even the next breath. Jesus is saying, it's urgent that you trust me now. Not only will it be harder when I'm gone, you may not have a tomorrow. Trust me. Believe in me now. It's presumptuous of us to believe that there will be... I'll, just, I'll do it another time. I'll do it the next time the gospel is presented. I, I, I'm not ready yet. Now, he's saying, now is the time. You may not have another time. If you think about this, God in Christ is offering us an infinite gift, a priceless gift for nothing. And many times people just shrug it off. Eh. Think of what a slap in the face of God that is for us to shrug about the gospel. Hmm? And it happens all the time. He says there's a great danger in unbelief. And he goes on. Let's see what he says. Although Jesus had performed so many miraculous signs before them, they still refused to believe in him. So that the word of Isaiah the prophet fulfilled, he said, Lord, who has believed our message? And whom has the arm of the Lord been and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because Again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn to me and I would heal them. Now this is obviously a prophecy from many years before in Isaiah. But the concept is this. Unbelief breeds more unbelief. If I am given the truth and I reject it or put it off, my mind is darkened. My ability to uh, understand that truth, it's a little bit harder the next time. So unbelief leads me to more unbelief. If I don't respond to the truth now, the next time it will be a little bit harder. My mind will be a little bit more darkened because I've rejected, I've refuted the truth. Now the problem it's not that we have something missing. It's not that I haven't been taught the right things. I haven't uh, read the right things. He's saying, no, this is a depravity problem. It's a heart problem. I don't reject the gospel because I haven't been told enough things about Jesus. Jesus performed signs and miracles. He raised a man up in front of people, and they still rejected him. Many of them did. I can't imagine that, but it happened. Rejecting a guy who just raised someone from the dead. They did it. It's a depravity issue of the heart. We reject Jesus because our hearts are hard and cold. The only way we can come to him is if the Lord draws us, right? It's only his work. And we know 
from Scripture that salvation, all of it, it's completely a work of God in our lives, right? Now, we obviously have the responsibility to respond in faith to His call to us, but He does all the work. He does all of the work of salvation, right? All of it is Christ's. So what he's saying here, this prophecy from Isaiah, is the concept that there may come a time, like what happened with Israel, where they had rejected truth enough where God says, all right, enough. I'm not giving you any more chances. I'm not giving you another opportunity. He's saying, Jesus is saying, we need to respond now to the truth at hand. You may not have another opportunity. He may not give you another opportunity, or you may not have another opportunity. You may, something may happen to you today. Tomorrow is not promised. The gospel time to respond is now. Now this is an encouragement to us as believers as we evangelize. It's it's morbid to think we may not have another opportunity to believe for those who haven't trusted Christ. But we as believers are called just to share. Just to share the truth of the gospel. God does all the heavy lifting. He does all of the work. You and I don't have to save people. We can't. We're just called to share. To be a testimony. To share the gospel. To share the truth with our lives. With our words. And then he closes out. And he talks about secret disciples. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess Jesus to be the Christ publicly so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. We know of two specific secret disciples, Nicodemus and then Joseph of Arimathea, the man who uh, had the tomb that Jesus' body was placed into. So there were at least two secret disciples that we know of. These were Genuine believers, men who had believed in Christ, but were fearful. If I come public with this in front of the authorities, they're going to cast me out of the synagogue. They were afraid of men and what men might think. Clearly, this grieves the heart of God. But it's something we all struggle with on some level, right? We all fear what men will say. There have been places and opportunities and times when I had the opportunity to be bold for Christ, to share Christ, to share my faith, and I I kept quiet because I was afraid of what people might think. All of us on some level struggle with this. Some people are more bold and just, I've got, one of our friends on our ministry team with Crossworld is an evangelist. He's shameless with the gospel and and the Lord has given him much fruit. I'm I'm not as bold and so I, I can tend to shrink back. I don't know where you are. But we should ask ourselves, do we masquerade sometimes as secret disciples? All of the people around us should know that we follow Jesus. We shouldn't be obnoxious. I'm not saying that we should pound people with the Bible. But they should see graciously in all that we do, in our words, what we say, how we act, how we respond, that Jesus is our Lord. Right? It should be obvious then, and we should speak about it. We shouldn't be ashamed. So, this is an encouragement to us as believers to ask ourselves, am I kind of secretive with my faith? Are there maybe people that I'm more open with and others that I just, I clam up? Am I afraid to share really who, who I am, my faith in Christ with those people? And he gives us one last exhortation. This is his last public exhortation. He, he shouts out, The one who believes in me does not believe in me, but in the one who sent me. And the one who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not obey them, I do not judge him. For I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me does not accept my words as as a judge. Sorry. The one who rejects me and does not accept my words has a judge. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So Jesus is fleshing out the idea. He came this first time as the servant king. His primary mission was one of salvation. He came to save. That is Jesus' message on his first mission. 
to earth. The first time he came, he came as the servant king. He gave everything, right? The second time he comes, we don't know when that'll be, but we know it will come and will happen. He will come as the conquering king. When Jesus comes the next time, he will come to destroy his enemies and establish his eternal reign over all. He will come in glory and he will come and rule with an iron scepter. And it will be obvious who is king. It will be Jesus. What he's saying here is, right now I give you the gospel. I give you the good news. Believe it. Trust in it. If you reject it here, at my second coming, that will be used as evidence to condemn you. That's heavy. He's saying, respond now. Trust in me now. So that at my second coming, it will be a joyful thing for you when I come to rule and to conquer. Because if not, I will come to judge you. And your rejection of me now will be the evidence that I present to condemn you one day. A classic verse that many evangelists use. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. If you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't trusted your eternity to him, Today is the day of salvation. There's no promise there'll be another opportunity. There's no promise there'll be another day of life. Now is the time to trust him. Let's pray. God, I I thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. I thank you that Jesus came this first time to save and that his message is simple, that if we will trust our eternity, our lives to him, by simple faith, that he will give us eternal life. Not only a life that spans into eternity, that we will be able to spend eternity with you, Father, but that we can have a quality of life that is radically different. God, I pray that we as believers would live, live with open hands and would live a radically different existence now and on into eternity. Thank you that we have the promise of eternal life in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.